Welcome to the speaker series for the Snohomish County Transportation Coalition. I'm Brock Howell, Executive Director of SnowTrack. Today, SnowTrack is excited to host Angie Schmidt to discuss the epidemic of pedestrian fatalities through a lens of race and class. As a mobility management coalition, SnowTrack advocates for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation by bringing together transportation and human service providers to identify mobility gaps and opportunities. SnowTrack focuses especially on the needs of people with disabilities, older adults, youth, and low-income individuals, as well as people of color, immigrants, refugees, veterans, tribal nations, um, and rural communities. With our speaker series, we hope to inspire our leaders and advocates with best practices from around the country and world and so I cannot be more pleased to have Angie Schmidt here with us today. We'll have a Q&A at the end, so be sure to think of your questions throughout the presentation and feel free to introduce yourself in the chat now. Let's get rolling. First, a quick overview of the current state of affairs in Snohomish County and Washington State. 2022 was a record year for traffic fatalities in Snohomish County with 58 fatal crashes resulting in 61 people dying. This is a huge increase over an average of 40 fatalities per year for the prior decade. With the worst corridor, uh, the worst corridor is the 14 mile stretch of SR99 and Evergreen Way, which goes through some of the densest, low income and most diverse neighborhoods of the county. In 2022 alone, there were 12 fatal crashes. By comparison, along the 22 miles of US2 from Everett to Gold Bar, um, there were three fatal crashes. Let's look statewide. From 2013 to 2021, total fatal crashes increased from 401 to 606 crashes. Almost half of this increase is attributable to the rise in pedestrian fatalities, which tripled from 49 to 144 over that period. By comparison, auto-only fatalities increased 270 to 259. Most troubling for pedestrians are that 250 of the 215 hit and runs in the state that resulted in death, 164 involved people walking or biking. The number of people older than 70 and younger than 25 involved in traffic fatalities is also increasing substantially. A close look at the data shows that underlying trends closely resemble the findings by Angie Schmidt in her book, Right of Way, Race, Class, and the Silent Epidemic of Pedestrian Deaths in America, published in 2020. Reported distraction, such as cell phones, is down, although surely this is an undercount, and while other causes, such as speeding beyond the posted limit, alcohol and drug impairment, and failure to use seatbelts are all up in total numbers, by percentage, they are not. This is why I'm so glad to have Angie here. In addition to authoring Right of Way, she wrote and edited for Street Blog for eight years and is the founder of 3MPH Planning and Consulting, where she conducts policy research, safety reviews, and mobility studies. Angie, it's great to have you. Hi, awesome. Thanks for having Hi. me. Can, can you guys see and hear me okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna get ready and share my screen. Um, that was a really nice introduction. So. Yeah, I've been traveling around the country virtually. A lot of it is virtually like this um, for the last few years, um, talking about what I call the pedestrian safety crisis in the US. So in this presentation, I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. Um, a little bit of a background and history uh, of the problem. Uh, we're gonna look at um, what I mean by the pedestrian safety crisis, who is getting killed because it's a problem that has a strong demographic component. Um, where where it's happening. Again, it has a strong geographic component. And if we look at where these wrecks occur, it gives us a good sense of sort of what's causing the problem. And then I like to warn people right off the back, there is um, or bat, there is a big section in the middle about cars. So you're forewarned. And then uh, at the end, we're going to talk about solutions. And there's um, also a little I added at the end just recently about reasons for optimism, because just since the book has been published, there, there, there has been some progress on a few key, key issues. Okay, so um, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but I did want to give a little historic background uh, for you folks. So um, 
These are two pictures of where I live, historic photos of Cleveland. And I'm just using Cleveland as an example here. But um, if you look at this picture here on the left, it, uh, it was taken in 1930. And it's a picture of sort of our main street in downtown Cleveland. It's called Euclid Avenue. And um, you can see that there actually are a few cars in this photo. So the auto era has kind of already begun in 1930 uh, in US cities. But at this point, it's still primarily a streetcar city. And you can see, um, one thing I wanted to, I'd like to point out about this picture is just how relaxed people look sort of crossing the street. Um, so historically, streets were public spaces and a lot of social activity took place in streets. Um, at this time in our history, there was no crosswalks, for example. Pedestrians had free sort of rights to the roads and um, they were used by children for play spaces. They were used by merchants a lot of times to sell goods out of carts. People would kind of pause and greet each other in the streets. But um, around this period, that changed dramatically. Um, and uh, if you look at this picture here on the right now, this is a different street. Keep in mind, but it's another downtown street of ours. And it's only 16 years later, you can see that all that social activity um, is displaced and how quickly sort of cars took over the, this space in our cities. So um, in, in a lot of cities, um, streets, Street right of ways, parking can take up 30 to 40 percent of the public space. Um, so between the time these two photos were was taken, there was a really important sort of um, ideological and political battle that took place, and um, it was sort of against on one on one side of the battle was mothers, um, a lot of bereaved mothers, because in the 1930s. Um, and 40s, when cars really start flooding into cities in a big way, after the, especially after the introduction of the Model T Ford, a lot of people started getting killed. And disproportionately, they were children. So there was really a lot of outrage about it at this time. And there's a, there's a writer named um, Peter Norton that wrote a really good book about it, about this time period. But the point is, there was a lot of sort of outrage about all the violence and bloodshed that's resulted from the introduction of cars in cities. And there was a movement to kind of limit um, sort of the domain of cars and cities. But obviously, we know who prevailed in that fight. And um, one of the big wins for the auto industry and auto-oriented issue uh, interests that had mobilized to defend sort of their interests was the introduction of this idea of jaywalking. So from that, um, in our modern era, we've thought of streets primarily as places to drive and drive fast and pedestrians right to the road is really very limited. They're only legally allowed in the road in certain locations and even then only when traffic is stopped. Okay, so that's all, I, that's all I'm gonna go into about history, but I wanna talk a little bit more about um, what we've seen more recently. So um, this is even a little outdated at this point, but we've seen this big increase in the last decade in pedestrian deaths. And this occurred while other traffic deaths did rise a little, but were, were fairly stable. Um, and this was really unusual. We, we, we generally have seen improving traffic safety outcomes since the 1970s when we started requiring things like seatbelts. So when this first started occurring in the early half of the last decade, a lot of people, even who are experts on traffic safety, thought it was just kind of a fluke or um, weren't sure what was causing it. But now we have a, a good sense of the causes, uh, which I'm gonna talk about more, and also that it's a sustained trend. Okay, um, and just to bring us a little bit up to speed. So the book, this, this book I wrote was published, sort of I finished it in February, 2020, like right before the pandemic really hit the fan. Um, and at the time I was a little bit panicked for obvious reasons related to the pandemic, but also I just, I thought, wow, is this really, is this problem even really gonna be re relevant anymore? Because people were doing so much less driving. We had these lockdowns where a lot of people were telecommuting. Um, but uh, so I really expected traffic deaths in general to decline and pedestrian deaths to decline as well. Um, that's generally what we see when uh, driving declines in a recession, for example. But what we actually saw was the exact opposite. Very, very bad outcomes coming out of the pandemic. We've seen we've seen huge increases. So when I wrote the book, it was about 6,500 people who were being killed a year. And it's now up to the latest I heard is about 7,700 people killed a year. Um, in almost every state now, it's more than one in 100,000. 
uh, per year annual mortality on this. Um, so so uh, a problem that was already really alarming got worse, basically. Got worse in a, in a surprisingly um, dramatic way. Okay, so that, that kind of brings us up to speed. Um, and now, now I wanna move into talking a little bit about who's getting killed. So um, I think the, the, I use these two images because I think there's this kind of stereotype in the media we see a lot, or maybe even from certain officials who have responsibility in this area where um, when they hear about a pedestrian being killed, their sort of um, first thought is it's kind of like this, this guy here on the left and he's uh, maybe a very wired millennial and he's crossing the street maybe in a major city and it's the middle of the day and he's maybe a little distracted by his cell phone. Um, and I think that the reason we see this sort of stereotype is just because this may be um, what people who are a little bit more privileged kind of encounter on their drive to work and just find annoying. But um, the reality is the kind of people getting killed are much, much more like this guy here on the right who's just kind of having to sprint across this wide suburban arterial. In this case, it doesn't even have a crosswalk. Maybe he's trying to catch a bus. Um, so a little bit more about in these next few slides about who is most at risk. Um, so this is referenced in the title and um, has been discussed a lot. I'm gonna talk about it more later in the presentation as well, but um, a lot of the, you know, I think it throughout sort of public health, and there's been a lot of recognition over the last few years that um, issues like systemic racism and inequality play out in a lot of our public health problems. And, and this is very similar. Um, Black people are at um, greatly increased risk to be killed while walking, and Native folks in particular are very high risk. Um, but other groups too, who are uh, a little bit marginalized, um, we, we see disproportionately killed this way as well. One group I wanted to mention just real quickly is older adults. Um, so people's risk to be killed while walking starts to rise when they're as young as 50 and is, is pretty elevated when they get into their 70s. Um, so a couple quick things about this. I'm not gonna dwell on this too much in the presentation, but I just did just wanna mention that as far back as about a decade ago, um, the Center for Disease Control predicted that pedestrian deaths would rise just because the American population is aging. So this is a very fast growing group in the United States. And that means that we're an older population, we're a little bit more vulnerable to being hit and killed this way. Um, in addition, I, the final point I wanna make about this is just that this is not a group we've done a very good job planning for in the US and in urban planning. Okay. Um, another group, real quickly, lower income folks, people who live in lower income neighborhoods, very, you know, whenever this is studied, uh, there's greater risk. Um, and that, there's two things going on here. Um, a, lower income people are more likely to rely on transit, more likely to rely on walking, more likely to rely on um, biking for sort of obvious reasons. Um, but also uh, their neighborhoods, they may not have, lower income neighborhoods may not always have sort of the political clout to get the safety improvements they like as well. So it's sort of a double whammy. Okay, so that's a little bit about who's getting killed. Now I wanna talk about where. And this map shows the most dangerous metro areas. I'm borrowing a lot from some really good research done by Smart Growth America. They do a dangerous by design report every few years where they're, um, where they're slicing and dicing this data. Uh, so I think if you look at this showing the most dangerous metro areas, there's a very clear pattern. And sometimes, um, I guess I'll give you guys a chance if anyone wants to chime in on the map, what they think is going on here, what kind of pattern they notice with the sort of geographic um, broad geographic look at which places. Yeah, someone mentioned Sunbelt. That's, uh, it's the South, definitely. And the Sunbelt in particular, every year when they do this report, Florida in particular is just a complete bloodbath. Um, a lot of times, like eight out of 10 at the top. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> Joe has done his homework here, yes. So a lot of times people will say, um, 
you know, these, the, these are warmer areas of the country. So people are walking more. Uh, it's true that the, these are warmer areas of the country, but um, as Joe said here in the chat, these are areas almost, um, that developed mostly after the rise of air conditioning in the U.S. So that happened, air conditioning comes online in about 1940 in the United States, and people start moving to the Sun Belt. People start moving to Florida because it's more comfortable. So 1940 is right about, if you think back to those first two pictures I shared, right about when the auto era really kicks into high gear in the U.S. So these places like um, Jacksonville, Florida and um, San Antonio are designed around cars. They're, they have a very sprawling land use, very wide roads. So they have this legacy of being developed around cars and some, some really dangerous infrastructure. So um, the final point I wanted to make about this also is that um, if you look at the most dangerous metro areas for walking in the U.S., they are almost always also the fastest growing places in the U.S. So this um, broad demographic shift we're, we're seeing in the U.S. where people are moving to the Sun Belt itself probably contributes as well. Um, uh, major population growth in Florida compared to safer places um, that developed earlier around the streetcar like Cleveland and Philadelphia. Um, a few states in particular, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of breeze past that one. Have have really high high rates. Okay, so um, we talked about sort of the role. Um, national migration has played in this problem. So I also want to talk a little bit about there's there's some demographic trends taking place at the local level that contribute to this problem as well. So um, this is a map of northern Atlanta. It shows the northern Atlanta suburbs. Um, and this is called a racial dot map. And what it shows is it, it's sort of designed to um, designed to show to illustrate segregation a little bit. So the orange areas are primarily whites, the green areas are primarily black in, the, in this map, and um, the yellow shows areas that are a little bit more diverse. So if we look back to 1990 at Northern Atlanta, the Atlanta, Atlanta suburbs, so this is Cobb and Gwinnett County, you can see at the time, a very segregated region. Like these um, suburbs were developed sort of around the time schools were desegregated, they were very white. The idea is they would be, you know, strictly traditional suburban, everyone would have a car, you know, white picket fence. So there wasn't a lot of effort put into, you know, transit, extending transit, transit to this area, or in, may, in many cases, there may have been sort of resistance to that. Um, but I just wanna show, so this is 1990, I wanna show the way the region has evolved a little bit. So it, it's, you know, Atlanta's a, and the Northern Atlanta suburbs, highly dynamic region, lots of population growth. And you can see this is outdated, a little bit outdated this, at this point, but you can see how much more diverse this region has become. Now, both of these Northern counties of Atlanta have about a million residents. So they're huge population centers now. And um, they've, they've changed a lot, including if you see this purple area up here at the top, certain areas of, um, Gwinnett and Cobb County now are sort of um, the first place is a lot of new immigrants land when they come to the United States, when they come to Atlanta, they're out in these suburbs um, in Gwinnett and Cobb County that have roads that are still designed in kind of a rural way. So people arrive from countries with much lower um, car ownership rates that have a much stronger, you know, culture around using transit and walking. They arrive maybe with no car in a place and they have to use a, a road that has no sidewalk, one bus an hour in these, um, these far flung locations where the housing is more affordable. So I'm not gonna dwell on this a whole lot more, but I do think this pattern, we see this pattern and I'm using Atlanta again, just as an example, but we see this pattern in every metro area. You know, we, we have a much more diverse suburbs than we've had in the past. And also we have, and this is a little bit, of, there's some overlap here. We also have um, suburbanization of poverty as this national trend. So um, the point being our suburbs have changed quite a lot in the last few decades, but the the infrastructure really hasn't changed very much to accommodate it. And that's putting a lot of people sort of in harm's way, potentially. Okay, so moving ahead, um, this is, again is another racial dot map and it shows Cleveland where I live. Again, we're just using this as an example, but um, 
you get the point. The um, green is um, black neighborhoods. The orange is white. Um, now, if we look at, we're a very segregated region. Again, these maps are a little out of date, but if you look, if we look at where our most dangerous road segments are in Cleveland, just to contrast that, they align almost perfectly. Um, and we see that in almost every metro area that we look at it. I'm, I'm not um, shifting from picking on Cleveland to sort of picking on Portland here now. Um, and uh, I borrowed some maps that they made um, at their Bureau of Transportation that are actually really nice. I love these maps. Um, and it, it, this one here on the left, it shows all the traffic fatalities that took place in 2017 and 2018 in, in Portland. And um, if you look again at this map, you can see that the they use the names of the victims to try and sort of humanize the problem, which is a nice thing to do, I think, a good idea. Um, but anyway, you can see that they're, they're not happening in a random pattern. There's this clear concentration over here on the right side of the map. So if we look over to this orange, um, this orange map over here, this is, they produce this other map and it shows the 30 most dangerous intersections in Portland. You can see the, the most dangerous intersections are the ones that show a little circle. So um, the, uh, for, for the purposes of this discussion, the important thing to know about Portland is there's a big socioeconomic dividing line at East 82nd Street and everything East of 82nd Street is called East Portland. Uh, probably a lot of you are familiar because you're sort of in the in the neighborhood, but um, East Portland is more diverse and lower income than the rest of the city. That's an important thing to know. So if we look at um, sort of where the most danger, so if we look at tra traffic crashes or fatalities, um, about half of all traffic fatalities that happen in these two years in Portland happen in East Portland, even though only about a quarter of the population lives there. So people who live in East Portland are twice as likely to be killed. And if you, and there, there seems to be a pretty clear story here about infrastructure inequality, something I talked about earlier. So um, these intersections that they show being the most dangerous out of the top 30 most dangerous intersections in Portland, 28 out of 30 are in East Portland. Okay, so I'm borrowing here for some research done by um, some academics at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I like to use this photo as an example of infrastructure inequality, something we talked about. Um, so this is um, this shows some tribal lands in Minnesota where the research was undertaken and it shows um, this, this is like a state a state highway and in between it, it separates a tribal service center on one side from a food seller on the other side. Um, so you can see um, how terrible the accommodations here are, that people sort of wore a path in the um, grass, that there's no crosswalk, that there's no lights, very dangerous conditions. So I mentioned earlier in the presentation that native people are at very high risk to be killed while walking. Um, and we don't fully understand the reasons, but one reason does seem to be that the conditions, there's underinvestment sort of in, in the types of safety amenities that would be helpful on reservations. And in addition, um, a, a good amount of walking, uh, at least according to this study, takes place on reservations. Um, so these researchers, they went out and they did, a, they did a, a lot of interviews with people who lived on the reservation, with tribal elders. And they also interviewed um, the people who worked at the state DOT, the people who had like the authority to change some of this. And uh, what they found was there was a big sort of disconnect. So when they talked to people who lived on the reservation, people from the community, they brought up pedestrian safety frequently as a top concern. Um, but the state DOT uh, officials almost never brought up pedestrian safety. And um, even when they were kind of pressed on it by the researchers, they were sort of defaulting to behavioral explanations like drunk walking, sort of blaming the victim. So. One of the lessons here, I think, is just A, about um, sort of better listening to the communities that are really affected by these problems. So people have a, you know, a, a good understanding of sort of what the problems are in their communities and they really deserve to be listened to. And I also think that part of the problem is probably not enough representation on the part of the people who were tasked with solving the problem. Okay, so I just wanna, um, I just want to reiterate a couple of points before I move on to this 
thing I warned you about, this portion of the presentation that's about cars. So just to reiterate a little bit, um, we've seen this big increase in pedestrian deaths. And um, one of the reasons, a couple of the reasons that it seems to be happening in it is A, the population is a little bit older, so a little bit more vulnerable to being killed. B, uh, people live in places that are a little bit more dangerous than they used to. They're more likely to live in the Sun Belt and they're more likely to uh, live in suburbs and um, be trying to sort of get around a little bit on, on foot, you know, out outside of center cities. So there's this third trend that's really important. And uh, there's uh, over the last decade or so, there's been this big shift in the vehicle mix in the United States. And this, this is the um, thing we can point to sort of most clearly scientifically as saying, this is, this is what's causing this big shift we've seen. So um, if you look back to sort of um, when we're coming out of the last recession, a little over a decade ago, um, the majority of new cars sold were sedans. And then since then, we've seen this big shift. This is even a little outdated now. And about um, three in four new cars sold now are SUVs or pickups. Um, so that turns out to have a big impact on um, pedestrian safety. So I'm using myself here for scale. I'm um, about five, six. So I'm just like a, a normal to I'm a little bit tall for a woman. So you can see if I was hit by this Honda Civic here on the left, and this used to be sort of like the normative car in like the 1990s when this problem was at sort of the lowest level we've seen in a long time. Um, but you can see if I was hit by a Honda Civic, it's, it's bad to be hit by a car no matter what when you're a pedestrian. But if I'm hit by this Honda Civic, I'm hit in the legs. So that's where I suffer the, the, the biggest blunt force trauma. And then maybe I fall forward onto the front of the car. Um, and actually, um, Windshields are designed to sort of crumple and cushion blows um, a little bit. So still not good, but um, but anyway, if, if you compare that to, if I'm struck by, this is a, a Toyota 4Runner, um, which is actually, it's I consider it kind of a huge car. I'm a little bit triggered by this car, but um, it's sort of a normative car now too. Like I said, it's considered a midsize SUV. So if you compare that, um, if I'm hit by this car, I'm going to be hit sort of in the chest or the abdomen, which is where all my internal organs are. So it's a, it's a worse place in terms of survivability um, to suffer a very hard blow. In addition, um, there is potential if I'm hit this way that I'm pushed under the car and run over by the wheels. So um, there was some really, um, there was some research done by the Federal Highway Administration in 2015. They sort of, um, sort of quietly released it, but they did a big, um, they did a big uh, summary of a bunch of research. And they, they, they found that um, people hit by SUVs are two and a half to three times more likely to be killed while walking or, hit while walking are two and a half to three times more likely to be killed. And um, for child pedestrians, it's even worse. They're more likely to be hit in the head. It can be uh, as much as four times greater. So um, just to have you and you're a captive audience, I thought I'd uh, just rant about cars a little more, just walk you through the evolution of, um, this is just the evolution of a single car. Um, uh, I think it's kind of interesting because it happens kind of, slow than fast. I think we're kind of inured to the way cars are now, but um, it wasn't that long ago that they were a lot smaller and uh, they they were a lot more, I guess, pro-social in their design. Um, and so this is a RAV4 and I just use a RAV4 because it's the number one selling vehicle in the US outside of pickup trucks. So you can see um, back in the late nineties, it, it's it's actually just, this, this is really just a Corolla that's a little bit tall. It's like a tall Corolla. Uh, they made a two-door model. It started out at 2,500 pounds. And like, a, if you look at the face, it's uh, it's really very cute. It's almost like smiling at you. Um, that that was the style in the 1990s with cars. Um, but but now the style has really shifted a lot. And what we see is um, a, a larger, larger vehicles are in style now. It's almost a thousand pounds heavier at the light end. Um, but we also, there's this big shift to sort of in the front end of the car. Uh, the, the vehicles now have what's called greater aggressivity. So this, this high grill is really in style now and the cars kind of scowl at you. 
now. Um, it's really gotten pretty crazy with pickup trucks. Um, specifically, this is sort of what I'm famous for showing this picture of this is my son when he's four years old, he's standing in front of a lifted, uh, Ford F-250. Um, so not only, you know, we see these really aggressive, um, we see these really aggressive grills now, um, not only is, uh, all the, um, issues I talked about earlier with, you know, our anatomy and how being hit by a car with a taller grill impacts survivability. There's also, um, there's also visibility issues that come into play with a, with a car like this. So um, a lot of the, um, so this is the Ford F series is the number one selling vehicle in the U S every year. And it has been for a long time. So the Ford F-250 and Ford F-150 together, you know, the Silverado is up there too. Those are like the top, top two selling cars every year. Um, and now that they, they've just gotten really, they've just gotten really big and aggressive and macho, uh, kind of violent looking, um, the, all the best selling, a lot of the best selling pickups now, they, they have 55 inch tall grills. So, um, that means that they come up to about like my chin. Um, so there's, there's a group called kidsandcars.org that sort of looked closely at the visibility issues around this. And, and they, they did all these experiments where they found, uh, they were able to place like as many as a dozen kids, um, seated kids in the blind zone of some of the best selling, uh, SUVs and pickups now in the U S. So this has contributed to, um, some crashes, you know, children being hit at close range called run over crashes, um, a huge increase in this. A lot, a lot of people can't see literally what's right in front of them in, in their cars anymore. Um, in addition, I'm wrapping up this rant about cars, but um, I just wanted to mention real quickly, this is something that is sometimes referred to the horsepower arms race, but cars are cars have become a lot more powerful. It used to be really rare for a car to have more than 200 horsepower. Now it's sort of the norm. We see cars with 300, 400 horsepower out on the streets. It just means they can accelerate really quickly. It's um, They can speed and speed is... Um, especially in neighborhood settings, extremely dangerous, a huge factor in um, pedestrian, whether pedestrians are going to su survive a crash or not. Okay, so I'm shifting gears. I want to talk a little bit about solutions. Um, but I, again, I just want to, I want to sort of review a little bit. Um, so we've seen this big increase in pedestrian deaths, and it's being caused by a few things. Um, you know, there's a few meta trends in our society that are all bad news for pedestrians. Um, one of them is that the population is getting a little older, they're more likely to live in more dangerous areas. And then thirdly, um, so they're more likely to be in more, more dangerous locations in the third place. And thirdly, when they're struck, they're being hit by heavier, faster vehicles, and it's more likely to be fatal. Um, so I know that's very depressing and a big bummer. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about solutions here in this next session. And at the end, we'll end with like some, a few reasons for optimism. So this is a woman, um, her name is Amy Cohen. Um, and she's holding a picture of her son, Sammy, who was killed by a driver in 2014 in New York City, in Brooklyn. Um, and she's someone I write about in my book. She's one of the heroes of my book. And um, it's interesting because like in the United States, I think when people, when they lose someone to a car crash, sort of the um, the default sort of explanation or the way the way we conceptualize it is just that it's sort of an act of God or just luck. And um, we, we haven't really connected it to sort of a lot of um, political decision-making really plays into um, how many people are hit and killed every year. But um, so Amy, her son was killed, which is very unlucky, um, but she happened to live in, in New York, where there is a very strong safe streets advocacy scene and biking and walking advocacy scene. And she got linked up with them and she started sort of putting together um, little pieces of information about programs that could have potentially saved him. And she got she got active politically. So she's standing here um, at a press conference uh, a protest they held um, with a few other mothers. So this woman here on the right, her husband was killed, um, and they they fought really hard for some reforms in, in in New York State and in New York City, including lowering the speed limit. Um, they now have speed cameras in school zones. Really, they fought very hard, and they they 
They're organizing these groups, Families for Safe Streets, they're called. They have chapters now, more than a dozen chapters all over the country. And so I think um, engaging victims sort of in this direct advocacy is, is a little bit new and a little bit exciting. And there's, there's definitely a need for more political sort of advocacy around this. Um, uh, another thing that's needed and actually is an opportunity that's coming up is a lot of our, there's a need for institutional reform. So um, right here, I'm, I'm uh, this is something I talk about in my book. I'm uh, There's this secret engineering manual or only an engineer would know about it, but it's called the MUTCD, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And it is, um, it's basically a law. Uh, it's it's uh, this, this guidebook that engineers use to design streets. And um, the MUTCD is full of sort of assumptions and biases against pedestrians that date back to sort of the height of the auto era in the United States. So one thing the MUTCD says is that, um, like for example, if a community wants to add a crosswalk with a traffic signal, um, the MUTCD says that is not warranted unless 83 people are crossing there per hour. So this is a location that doesn't have a safe crossing at this point. They, they say there's, there, we're not, it's not worth um, delaying drivers with a traffic signal unless 83 people are crossing per hour. Yeah, um, failing that, if five people are struck in a single year, there is an exception and they'll warrant a traffic signal. So anyway, this type of bias is sort of baked into our institutions, puts people at risk. And um, fortunately, uh, so there's a need to reform the a lot of these institutional practices. And um, fortunately the MUTCD is up for review right now. And I'm really hopeful, um, there's been a lot of advocacy around it. And I'm really hopeful that administration in Washington right now is going to, um, take action to reform that. Okay, so here's another pop quiz for you guys. Um, who can tell me what cities these are? This is a this is a photo taken from, from space by NASA. Um, yes, <laughs> right away. Okay, yes, absolutely. This is Detroit here at the top. Someone guessed correctly. And this is Cleveland where I live here at the bottom. So I just want, one thing I want to point out about this. So you notice that Detroit looks bluer than Cleveland in this picture. This is actually a big success story. So um, street lighting is kind of an issue that sometimes get, gets overlooked, but it's very important. Um, about three and four pedestrian deaths happen at night. Um, and I think like it goes back to this a little bit, this issue I talked about of, you know, the privilege of sort of the people who are in decision-making roles. I think a lot of, you know, myself included, um, a lot of us maybe can take for granted that the streetlights work in our neighborhood, but that's not the case for everyone. So Detroit, when they're coming out of bankruptcy a decade ago, they did this big survey and they found out that, um, I believe it was about 40% of their streetlights were broken. They weren't working. Um, so they decided they issued a big, they issued a big bond package and they decided to get all their streetlights working and they switched them to LED. So that's why in the previous picture, Detroit looked blue while Cleveland was still like a little bit orange. So uh, so I, it's interesting to look at what happened with pedestrian deaths around this time. So um, if you look back to 2013, before this project starts, they're having as many as 25 deaths a year in the city of Detroit in, in um, dark, unlighted conditions. So the street light project takes place over three years, 2014 to 2016. And you could see by the last year, those deaths just stop occurring, basically. They go from having 25 a year to having just one in dark, unlighted conditions. And over just three years, they see about a 30% decline in, in pedestrian deaths. That occurs while nationally and elsewhere in Michigan, we're seeing this huge escalation. So this is a success story. I just want to highlight and mention street lighting. Um, here's another cool little success story. It's a little before and after picture, we can redesign our roads, basically. We can redesign our most dangerous roads um, relatively inexpensively to have a big impact on um, safety for people who walk. So this is this example comes from Columbus, Ohio. It's called Sullivan Avenue, and it's a very, um, it goes through a very poor neighborhood, uh, and it was one of the most dangerous. So um, they, they did a, they did a, a sort of a modest, I think, road redesign here um, from the 
the um, this picture on the left to so this picture on the right, they use just bump outs here. Some of them are bus bump outs. So they pulled out the curb a little bit to shorten the crossing distance here. They use concrete to do that. And they added just these little medians, these little concrete medians. So this is a pretty new project, but the, um, the uh, city of Columbus told me recently that when this project was completed, um, excessive speeding stopped almost immediately and serious crashes were pr practically eliminated. So again, it's a very new project, but we have examples from all over the country where um, some intentional sort of um, interventions on the street design can have a huge impact. Um, and uh, one reason, I guess, is we're shifting to reasons to be optimistic, one reason to, for us to feel optimistic that we can resolve this problem is that, as was pointed out in the earlier presentation, in a lot of cities, there are just a handful of streets that account for an overwhelming portion of these kind of deaths and injuries. So um, we don't have to redesign every street right away. We can focus on a few key corridors and really have an impact. Okay, so. With that, like I said, uh, shifting to, I wanna end the presentation with just a few reasons to be optimistic. One of them is there's a new grant program that comes out of the infrastructure bill called Safe Streets and Roads for All. And it's a discretionary grant, so places have to compete for the funding. But what this means is for the first time ever, um, cities are getting big money or uh, some serious funding from the federal government to do Vision Zero, to do safe streets interventions, to study the problem. Um, they just got, uh, they just distributed $400 million um, in the first round. Uh, places all over the country that really need this money are finally getting it, finally getting some support from the feds and have an opportunity to prove that they can, um, they can make an impact on this problem. Um, another cool development, since I wrote my book, I'm really excited about this. Um, somebody, um, I don't know the full story, but somebody inserted language into the um, infrastructure bill that is for the first time going to require vehicles to be um, rated for pedestrian safety. So in the past, you know, when you have a five-star rating on your car, that's something that comes from a system called NCAP. We rate cars for safety. Um, but we, we've never tested, we've never, um, the federal government has never officially tested how safe cars are for people outside the vehicles or warn consumers about, you know, those kind of risks. So for the first time, they're going to be required to do that. They're also going to be requiring um, certain new technology that has the potential to have an impact, like automatic emergency braking. It's going to be required on all new cars coming up in a few years. Another thing they're looking at closely is automated pedestrian detection. Um, which is sort of a new technology, but again, can prevent cars before they hit pedestrians. It, it's an auto braking function before they hit someone. So, um, so one thing I want to say about this is this technology is a little bit new and um, it hasn't been held to any federal standard. So it's a little bit buggy, we know right now, but even right now, um, there's some research like the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety um, they did a study and they found that Subarus that were equipped with this advanced safety features package were 35% less likely to file an insurance claim for a wreck with a pedestrian. So there's, there's pretty big potential that once this um, technology and it's partially automated technology comes online in more cars, and that's going to start to happen um, in the next few years that uh, it will have an, a, a positive impact as well. Okay, and finally, um, we're gonna we're gonna shift over to questions. Um, perfect timing. But I, I one uh, one final reason for optimism I just wanted to leave folks with is that we have started to see certain cities who have made serious commitments to Vision Zero, um, to traffic safety, um, start to achieve big reductions in pedestrian deaths and um, traffic deaths overall. So. Just in case anyone's not familiar on this call, Vision Zero is this idea that comes out of Sweden and this idea that we should not accept traffic deaths sort of as the cost of doing business. We should work to gradually eliminate them and um, uh, sort of reduce uh, the potential for wrecks when they do occur to become fatal or cause serious injuries. 
Um, so it, this is um, this this photo is from Hoboken, New Jersey. I don't know if anyone's heard about that, but it, it's a city. It's just outside of New York, and they they actually have achieved Vision Zero. They had for the last four years, they've had zero traffic deaths. And the, um, one thing they've done here that's really cool: a lot of these interventions don't have to be very expensive. If you look at these bollards they have here, this is called um, intersection daylighting, and basically it just prevents cars from parking right next to the crosswalk where they would create sort of a big blind zone that could be a safety hazard. Um, they, they've had a lot of success in Hoboken just with uh, little interventions like this, intersection daylighting. So there's all kinds of tools and lessons we can apply from some of these places that are having some success. I think um, there's other examples like Madison, Wisconsin, it's one city that's achieved pretty um, substantial reductions. There's another, there's an example out in California, Fremont, California, a suburb is another city. So, um, and uh, Jersey City, uh, which is a neighbor of Hoboken, um, in the last year had zero traffic fatalities outside of state highways. So it's sort of, um, there's, a, there's a few examples of um, U.S. cities that have either achieved Vision Zero or are sort of on the cusp. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I, I think that there, there, this should really inspire other places that are different at different points in their journey, um, sort of proof of concept, and um, there's a lot more we can do. So uh, with that, I don't, I'm not 100% sure how we're we're going to moderate this. Um, yeah, uh, that was great, Angie. Uh, fantastic presentation. I guess I will ask a question just to lead off with the Vision Zero here. Um, and then uh, folks in the audience, I'm sure you have questions too. So feel free uh, to raise your hand, come on camera, write the question in the chat, uh, whichever you would like to do. And we will try to you know, balance out the questions among the attendees here. So first question is with Vision Zero, um, as cities have adopted it over the last decade or so in the US, um, we were pretty unfamiliar with vision. Many of the cities were pretty unfamiliar with the uh, with how Sweden implemented in other European cities. And so many of our plans were kind of just reboots of existing traffic safety plans that heavily featured enforcement and education. And uh, I'm specifically thinking of like Chicago, uh, where we had uh, a lot of people of color ended up proposing the Vision Zero plan. I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of how cities have implemented it and how we, what your recommendations are uh, for cities moving forward, especially as those Safe Streets for All grants start to be implemented. Yeah, so I, I do think a lot of cities, obviously, their Vision Zero efforts haven't been very effective. They haven't put in the resources that they need. Uh, there hasn't been sufficient follow through. I think you're right that a lot, a lot of, in a lot of cases, um, it amounted to just a lot of additional enforcement, which, um, and enforcement that may not have been especially effective either. Um, so, I, and I actually spoke to someone from Sweden. Oh, a lead person for Sweden Vision, Sweden's Vision Zero efforts um, for my book. And he said he doesn't, in Sweden, they wouldn't even consider, they wouldn't consider enforcement of Vision Zero. They, it's a really much more, they're, it's really strictly about sort of design. Um, that being said, and um, there, there's, uh, we, we have seen, I, I do think one of the reasons we've seen this really uh, extreme escalation in the last few years is because a lot of places have, pretty much stop doing traffic enforcement at all. And there's a lot of recklessness and we haven't really figured out a way to rein that in without um, raising some of the problems that were brought up in 2020 around traffic enforcement. Like for example, in New York and Washington, there's this plague apparently of people driving around with fake tags. It's just um, complete lawlessness. So I think, uh, I think there's definitely a need for some sort of innovation around the way we've done enforcement um, so that we can find a way that doesn't raise the same kind of problems that uh, inspired protests in 2020, but isn't sort of leaving us in a situation where it's a total free for all in our streets and we, we're seeing wildly increased traffic fatalities as well. Um, 
So I'm going to, because of your answer, I'm going to take the liberty to ask a follow-up and then I'm going to go to Carl's in the, in the chat and then to you, Joe. Um, so in 2021, the, our state legislature greatly expanded our, the ability of local communities to implement traffic uh, speed cameras. Um, we can now do it at virtually any school, uh, safe route to school, so the route getting to the school, hospitals, parks, not just playgrounds, um, as well as high collision uh, locations, up to one per 10,000 residents. Um, of course, there's lots, we haven't had any city take advantage of this new authority yet, just using the pre previous existing authority around uh, school zones that we've had before. Uh, what are your thoughts on school zone cameras and how they can be implemented equitably? Yeah, so I think it's, I think it's, it has to be done really carefully, but there's potential for it to be a lot more equitable than police stops, I think. Um, so oh, there was concern about sort of where they're placed. There's concern about, you know, low income people being sort of overwhelmed with fines in New York City right now, where they where, where they have a they have a large speed camera program. They have people driving around that have like hundreds of tickets that they just haven't figured out a way to collect on. So there's, um, uh, which I think is, I think it's bad. Like I, I think if we can't if we can't um, be imposing some kind of serious restraint on at least the most one percent dangerous drivers in cities like New York, um, what are we doing? Like what are what, what are we talking about? Vision? I just I think it's a sort of advocation of you know, leaders' responsibilities. So I, I do think it, it has to be handled really carefully, but there's the potential for it to be fairer than the way we did before. There's a potential for it to be fairer, less dangerous for both police and for the people involved and a lot cheaper. Um, but we do have to sort of innovate a little bit in order to address some of these equity concerns, I think. Uh, so Carl Omgren's question, and just so you know, he's a planner at, with the city of Linwood, uh, asks what your thoughts are on electric cars that are heavier, but typically offer more safety features for auto braking to avoid collision. Yeah, and I was it's just a really good Tom question. Hinkson, Tom Hinkson, really our, question. our uh, director of uh, Everett Transit, also mentioned how quiet they can be as well. Yeah, so I think it's something we need to watch. I think it's something we need to watch. It is true that it's true that electric cars are going to be heavier, um, a little bit heavier. And it also depends. I think a lot depends on what kind of form electric cars take. Like a lot of a lot of electric cars right now are Teslas and Tesla. There's a lot of bad things about Tesla, but to their credit, they sort of have popularized sedans again, which is kind of good. Um, and well, they do make an SUV, but I think their SUV is is a modest side that's be. It's like on the spectrum, it's a little more towards a sedan. But um, a lot of people are really concerned once they start just, you know, putting an electric motor or, or electric battery in a Ford F-250, what happens then? Um, and I, I reached out to, I reached out to the uh, Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, who I trust and kind of asked them what they thought about this. And, and they told me that they weren't concerned like that, that an electric F-250 was going to cause a big increase in pedestrian deaths because they said, Pedestrians are being hit by F-250s already aren't surviving very often. They said that their concern is that these elect these really heavy uh, SUVs and pickups will, will lead to an increase in passengers killed when they strike another car, they said was their concern. So uh, honestly, I think we need to watch it very closely. Um, but I do think I, sometimes people online, I find, I find it like, Kind of disturbing. We'll we'll make an argument that like, we should um we should not electrify our vehicle fleet because of pedestrian deaths. I just think well that's a little bit goes a little too far. I mean we don't want India to become uninhabitable because you know we're worried about you know pedestrian deaths rising a little bit. We have to sort of manage these co competing concerns in a compassionate way. Um and uh, to the point about. The very good question, and I get asked this a lot about the sound that electric cars make. Uh, people always ask me that. I never knew how to answer it, but I recently um, traveled to Texas not that long ago and spoke um, at an event that was sponsored by the School for the Blind down there and the visually impaired. 
Um, and uh, I spoke with an expert. Um, he was a blind man who'd um, done uh, advocacy work in the field, a professional his whole life. And he said he was on the international, there was an international group that met and set standards for the sound for that electrical vehicles would make. And this, this only went into place a few years ago. So not all electric vehicles are up to this new standard, but he, he told me that he thought the issue had been resolved. So the sound issue, at least, I mean, and he, he's not the final word and I'm not the final word there, but that, that's what he told me. He thought that they, 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 they now have like a little humming noise and he said he thought that was sufficient. Nice. Uh, Joe, you wanna? Sure, thanks for calling on me, Brock. You know, really great question so far. Uh, really great discussion of electric vehicles. Yes, it's a battery electric bus behind me. Uh, Angie, I've been reading your book. It is nothing short of scholarly work. And it's something that you know, I'd love to recommend, but um, you've tweeted a lot about open schools. And I have to say, as somebody who had to help fight for public health, that it makes me a little nervous. Hey, Joe, so, yeah. We're, that's um, off topic for today. So I think it's I'm important. To, to, all right, I'll make it quick. It. I'll, I'll rephrase it. I tell, how about we do that? We've had a lot of learning loss because of this pandemic. So how can we kind of, you know, get people to not relitigate the past pandemic and all the other issues and focus on doing things like having learning all year and other things you think would get people back in this families back in the cities? Let's try that question, eh? That work, Brock? I think it's a, a little bit, so I might redirect a little bit more. Um, Angie, um, what can we do for, obviously, uh, kids getting to school uh, is a really important consideration. Um, just uh, what kind of things should be cities look, should cities look at in terms of improving walking and biking to school, and both from a program side as well as the infrastructure side? Yeah, um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I, it's such a big, <laughs> such a big can of worms, all that. Um, uh, I, I'd like to, I'd like to school with my kids. You know, I have, a, I had a kindergartner in 2020 and I have a, I have a, I now I have a kindergartner, a second grader I'm trying to raise in the city of Cleveland. Um, and I do think it's important that, um, I do think it's important that kids and low-income kids that services for them um, are protected. Um, and they're, they're, we're, we're sort of protective of our institutions. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, you know, I, I do think like kids are kids have become sort of marginalized in public space. I would guess. I, I guess I would say um, is one of my opinions, and that you know they're not they're not always like really welcome in cities the way they should be. Um, so that goes, that goes to the way we've designed our streets, the way we sort of treat parents, you know, the way we heap responsibility on parents without accepting sort of community responsibility for kids' safety when they're traveling to school and all kinds of things. But I, I, you know, I think it's, it's important, it's important to talk about and it's important to keep at the front of our minds, you know, um, uh, and that, that we could do a lot better. Angie, thank you so much for your presentation today and for the Q&A, uh, quite excellent. Um, I'm just gonna wrap us up here in a moment. Um, so we have a, a few events I want to highlight before everybody goes to so make sure uh, you're paying attention to them and signing up. Um, we have three, uh, more uh, events in our speaker series with Melissa and Chris Bruntlett, the authors of Curbing Traffic on May 17th. On June 1st and 21st, we are partnering with Transportation Choices Coalition to host Jarrett Walker, author of Human Transit, how clear thinking about public transit can enrich our communities and our lives. And then Nathan Voss, a King County Metro bus driver and author of The Lines That Make Us Stories from Nathan's Bus. And finally, uh, I would be remiss not to mention, uh, just on that last question, in fact, uh, today is National Walk, uh, sorry, National Bike and Roll to School Day, and this is Bike Month. So you can get involved uh, by either joining one of the challenges locally, rideshareonline.com is a good way, or nationally, lovetoride.net. Um, and then 
Bike Everywhere Day is on May 19th. And there are four great locations where you can get kudos for uh, biking to work or wherever you, you ride. Um, so uh, be sure to check out those locations on May 19th. And with that, thank you so much uh, for attending today. I hope to see you soon.